Good evening, everybody. This is Ethan Fry at the Valley Independent Sentinel. I'm here with uh, Seymour School Board members, Kristen Harmeling and Yashu Patorti. And uh, we're here for a webinar on the Seymour School Budget Request for 2015. We're also joined by Assistant Superintendent uh, Rick Belden. And uh, I, I'll turn it over to Kristen now, who will go through a presentation about the uh, school budget request for 2015-2016. Guys, it's uh, over to you. Thank you, Ethan, and thank you, Eugene, for um, hosting this event for the second year in a row. Uh, it's really exciting to us to be able to bring people information in a different kind of way, in a way that doesn't require you to come out on a snowy March 31st, which shouldn't actually be a sentence, but yet it is. So um, thank you for joining us. And the also nice thing about this is that if uh, people are not on the call or listening to the webinar right now. This is always available for playback. So it'll be there up on the web for people to hop on, fast forward to certain sections, listen and, and gain as much knowledge as they can about our schools and about our school budget request. There will be time at the end for a question and answer session. If you have questions about any particular slides that I'll be showing you tonight, just take a little quick note of what slide number that is and we can refer back to that during the question and answer session. So tonight, I want to speak to you about three myths that deserve debunking about our Seymour school system. The second part of the presentation, we'll move into some of the highlights of the budget. And then lastly, as I mentioned, we'll wrap up with questions and comments. This budget presentation is a little bit different than the one we did last year in that we're not providing um, a ton of slides on the budget itself we felt like most people that we got feedback from really wanted some of the highlights they wanted the top line numbers and they wanted enough context around the budget to understand why they should support it why they should push back on it but all of the budget information is publicly available so if you are a numbers person and you want to dig deeply into all of those 73 line items you are more than welcome to and the budget information is available on both the town website and the board of education website and if there's any trouble finding them, just give us a quick email. So the three myths I'm gonna talk about tonight, first is that Seymour overspends on education, and I hope to prove to you that we do not. The second myth that I'm gonna talk about is that nothing ever gets reduced or comes out of the Board of Ed budget. And the last, but, the last myth I'll speak with you about is that Seymour doesn't receive a good return on its investment in education. And the way we came up with these three myths to talk about is working collaboratively with Board of Education members and our Community Communications Committee, we were all talking about what do we hear on the sidelines at soccer games, at football games, on the line at Dunkin' Donuts, what do people say about our school systems? And these are some of the things that I have heard people say over my tenure on the Board of Education and also, quite frankly, as long as I've been in the town. So we thought maybe we should address some of these issues to explain to people why we're a pretty good investment and why the budget request that we're asking for this year is quite reasonable. So the first myth is that Seymour overspends on education. So there's a couple of different ways that we can look at per pupil spending. Um, there are a couple of different ways we can look at um, metrics. This is one of them. And per pupil spending is actually a, a very easy metric to look at. And simply what you do is you take a school's budget and you divide it by the number of children in that school. So what you see along the x-axis is different ranges of per pupil spending. And you can see that the state median, meaning half the district spend more than this and half the district spend less than this, is $15,000. And it's got quite a long tail with a couple of districts spending quite a lot on a per pupil basis. But look at where Seymour falls. Seymour spends $13,000 per pupil. That's about $2,000 lower than the state average. And as you can see, it's quite close to the bottom of the list. We're in about the bottom 15% in terms of the 169 districts in the state of Connecticut per pupil spending. So for me to debunk this myth, I feel like this is almost the only slide we need. Um, 15,000 is the state median. We spend $2,000 less per student. But I'd like to share with you looking at these numbers in a different list. Um, some people have said, well, we shouldn't compare ourselves to every district in the state because districts are so dramatically different from each other. And that is absolutely true. So what we did on this slide was we took a look at districts that were exactly our size. 
So just take a look at districts that have between 23 and 2,500 students. There are 12 districts in our state that have that many children, and as you can see, Seymour is dead last in terms of per pupil spending. The last way I want to express these numbers to you is through a comparison of districts that are in our district reference group. A district reference group is a classification system in which districts that have similar, that have public school students with similar socioeconomic status and need are grouped together. There's seven different metrics that are used to develop um, a number to place a district into a district reference group. And the intention of creating district reference groups is to group like districts together in order to make more legitimate apples to apples comparisons among districts, if you will. So Seymour is in DRGF, and there are 17 other, there are 17 total districts in our district reference group. And of the 17 districts, we rank fourth from the bottom. So we've looked at ourselves in comparison to the state, in comparison to districts that are our size and within our district reference group, and there is just no evidence that speaks to us overspending on education on a per pupil basis. And I wanted to wrap up this portion of the, the myth busting section of the presentation, offering some food for thought. So um, I mentioned that we were $2,000 below the state median when it comes to per pupil spending. We have about 2,300 students in district. So if we actually had $2,000 more for each of those 2,300 students, the school budget would increase by $4.6 million. That is not something this Board of Education would ever seek. It's not on our radar screen. It was not my intention in showing you those numbers and in drawing attention to our per pupil spending. But we thought it would be kind of fun, maybe a little sad, to say, well, what would we do if we even just had an additional $200 per student? And this is over this year's budget request. So this is a hypothetical. These are not things we're asking for. This is just simply to illustrate for you what $200 more per student could do for our schools. So a hypothetical increase of $460,000 over the current requested budget could go towards things like additional intervention for students, more teachers, more tutors, um, a more robust scientifically researched behavioral intervention program. We use this system in our schools now. We have been seeing success with it, but the more teachers we had to run those programs and hold those classes and tutoring sessions, the greater benefit it would be to our kids. We would have a world language program starting in elementary school, and we would have language labs in the middle and the high school. Right now, we only offer Spanish in the middle school and um, might end up getting that to that place in the high school as well. We would have K through 12 curriculum support to ensure that we had a cohesive curriculum and that our kids are prepared for the next step of their education, whether that next step means from second grade to third grade, eighth grade to ninth grade, 11th grade to 12th grade. If we had someone that could take that overarching view and look at our curriculum, our kids would be better served. If we had some extra money, we'd have additional physical education classes in elementary school, additional time for chorus, band, orchestra in the elementary schools, and a stronger fine arts program in the middle and high schools. So all of these are examples of things that we don't have in Seymour right now or that we don't have enough of. Um, they shouldn't be wish list items. So these, are, these are serious things that could have a significant positive impact on the academic achievement for our kids. Um, things like, you know, having music early and often is proven to help the brain develop and be strong in math and strong in other kinds of skills. So these are not pie in the sky, wouldn't it be nice if things that, um, that we could bring into our district, but yet in Seymour because of our budget environment and because we spend $2,000 less than the state median per pupil spending, that's exactly what they are. So the last thing I want to point out in terms of this myth is that over the course of um, the past several years, our budget increases have been quite modest, the request that we've put in. You can see in 2009-10 and then 10-11, we uh, received a 0% increase, and then you can see modest budget request increases over the past several years. Our original request this year was 3.2%. Um, we're not getting 3.2%.
Uh, prior to the town hearing, the Board of Finance cut our budget by about $67,000. So right now, the budget for the Board of Education stands at about $32.7 million, and that represents a 2.99% increase over last year's budget. So these are modest requests, averaging 1.5% over the past um, nine years or eight years. The second thing I want to talk about is people have said that, well, you know, you guys never take anything out of your budget. So once you get approval to put a line item in your budget or once you have a cost in place, that never goes away. And every year you just want to add more and more and more on top of what you already have. And that's not true either. Um, there are 73 specific line items in our budget. And this year, when we look at the increases we're asking for this year over last year, Nearly half, or 34 out of 73, of all those line items have a 0% increase or they actually have a decrease. And the decreases are totaling just over 300,000 in reductions. That 300,000 reductions is made up of things like the elimination of two teaching positions. There's a high school teacher retiring that won't be replaced. And we have a current vacancy for our library media specialist and we're choosing not to fill that. So effectively taking that position out of our budget. Um, as is the case in most years, if we have a retiring, a retiring teacher, that teacher is replaced for savings by a teacher who's at a lower step. This year we're doing away with the part-time athletic director position. These duties will be performed starting in the next budget year by one of our high school system principals, saving the district $34,000. If we can take savings, in the heating fuel and the bus fuel line items, of course we take them. If we can find ways to save in terms of technology services, we do so. We expect to have a small savings um, when we have a new associate superintendent in place come this summer. Um, Nancy Snapkowski is retiring this year, so that will also realize a small amount of savings. And when we've got a club or a service in place for our students that's not being used, we eliminate that. We don't leave these things in here um, to allow teachers to create, you know, receive stipends for not doing work on behalf of kids. So the French club didn't have any membership, so the French club will go away. That's also been taken out of our budget. The other thing we do to hold the line on our budget and try to get zero percent increases or decreases in individual items, line items is that we work with the town on many cost-saving initiatives and we often lead these efforts. And this is the point of my presentation where I usually feel guilty for saying the word we, because this is not me. This is actually not often the Board of Education. This comes mostly from central office, um, and Mr. Rick Belden is tremendous at looking for ways that we can save money by doing things like joining consortiums, by um, putting people and talking to people about different ways that they can get their health insurance that actually benefits the employees, but also costs the town less. Now looking at that third bullet, um, we successfully moved more than expected amount of employees to a lower cost, high health care savings account plan, and we saved the town over $300,000, not this year, but in the past two years. This year, we've actually set the stage, and we've kind of um, made it the way that the town has moved as well, and now the town is going to be able to reap $340,000 in savings this year alone by moving employees to the same health care plans that the Board of Ed has moved employees to in the past two years. And last, at every portion of our school system, whether we're talking teachers, principals, central office staff, assistant principals at the high school, um, people are aggressively pursuing grants to enhance instruction and provide opportunities to students. These include things like state grants for Chromebooks and laptops, for school security upgrades, Perkins grants for vocational technical education programs that are held at the high school, et cetera. Unfortunately, the things that we do to try to hold down costs, get grant money in, um, take things out of the budget when they're no longer needed, these are not enough to pay for our obligations and growing needs. As a service organization, one that um, is comprised of employees who, who are in unions, most of our contracts are on a three-year budget cycle, so a three-year negotiation cycle. So the work that the Board of Education does happens all the time whenever a contract is coming up due. And it is contractual obligations. It's paying for our staff, the same staff that teach our children and take care of our children. So it's these contractual obligations and known cost adjustments like health insurance that drive nearly all changes to the school budget. So just to talk about some of them, um, and all of the ones listed on this sheet here are things that you'll see increasing in this year's budget relative to last year. 
No organization is immune from rising healthcare costs, but our increase is lower than what you would see in the market. Yes, we reap the savings in fuel and gas, but just like our own home bills, they're eaten by increases in electricity. We have a $25,000 increase in professional services due to the New England Academic Association accreditation process this year. That happens once every 10 years. We have an increase in workers' compensation insurance due to some claims that we'll be paying this year, an increase in retirement benefits, transportation costs, and an increase in the number of children with special needs and commensurate increase in costs of providing services to those children. And last, our contractual commitments for salary increases. But I do want the town to know that no bargaining unit is receiving more than a 2.99% salary increase. The last two things on this slide are the things that are our key budget drivers. They're the things that are driving the numbers upward more than others this given year. The last myth I'd like to bust for you all tonight is that Seymour doesn't receive a good return on its investment in education. I want to talk about three aspects of a return on investment. Um, you know, we all like hard numbers and we all like to be able to say, oh yes, I get X amount back when I invest whatever in whatever stock. Well, for a town, some of those returns on investments are intangible. They're kind of softer measures, if you will, but they contribute to the quality of life that we all enjoy in Seymour. So I'm going to talk quickly about economic vitality, community vitality, and then the academic achievements and the career opportunities that our students benefit from and achieve in. So in terms of the middle school and the elementary school, some of our more noted academic achievements and opportunities include things that you see here on slide 25. So for example, there's been a 25% increase in the percentage of students entering first grade at reading level since Seymour made the investment to implement full day kindergarten. So our kids are coming into first grade as readers or ready to read. And this has made a tremendous difference on how far first grade teachers are able to grow our students. Over 40 fifth graders receive the President's Education Award for Outstanding Academic Excellence each school year. We have elementary school students participating in statewide programs like Celebration of the Arts, Leadership Conference, and Marine Science Day. We had 25 middle schoolers compete in math counts at Yale University, and one of our students ranked in the top 15 and advanced to the state competition. And each year for five years, eight seventh and eighth graders have participated in the Science Olympics at Laurelton Hall, placing first or second in the past three years. At the high school level, we have students who were invited to play with the Yukon First Chair Band Festival. We had students who placed or medaled in the state DECA business competition. The Alternative Energy Club has placed in the top three for three consecutive years in the state electrothon using a car that is built by students and funded by a grant obtained from our high school administration. For people who like harder metrics, some test score metrics, if you will, the high school ranks second in the state in the computer-aided drafting and design assessment. That's a STEM course. That's a course that is teaching our kids how to use um, different CAD programs and 3D printers. So it's just an incredible opportunity for our students to be able to learn and experience those kinds of skills. And clearly, they're doing well, ranking second in the state on that statewide assessment. And our high school students rank third in the state in the business management assessment. Talking about AP courses for a moment, we offered 13 AP courses this school year alone, and the percentage of high school students who take AP courses is up from 29% in the 2010-11 year to 47% in the 14-15 school year. So not only are we offering these opportunities for our kids, but they are oftentimes grabbing onto them and really taking it on themselves to pursue. I wanted to call your attention to the last uh, picture on this slide. This is a picture of the high school lobby, and you'll see a lot of banners up there. Um, every time a student gets accepted into a college, uh, we find a way to get a banner hung up on the lobby so that when the students come to school, they are, I hope, um, quite inspired by all the different variety of colleges that their, um, their peers are going to. And you know, if you're not in 12th grade yet and you're in ninth grade or 10th grade, I think it's just an amazing thing to see the diversity and variety of colleges that Seymour students attend and get accepted to. In terms of community vitality, this particular list was literally four times longer than what I'm showing you tonight. Um, the things that our principals shared with us that their students and their staff are doing is just tremendous. So a few highlights. Bungay School raised over $10,000 for diabetes research. 
We bring senior mentors into our elementary schools each week to read with and help students strengthen their literacy skills. Every year, the middle school has a holiday hope tree and this year, 65 gifts and monetary donations were provided to, to Seymour families. So gifts to 65 Seymour families. Turkey donation, a huge hit every year. This year, we're starting a new mentoring program led by um, Mr. Ernie DeStacy, assistant principal at the high school, as well as Ed Stramello on the Board of Education. The program is called Bound for Success and is intended to connect successful Seymour residents with Seymour students. Seymour students and staff raised $12,000 for Valley United Way in the past two years. And anybody who lives in Seymour knows the tremendous turnout this community has when we're asked to step up and donate time and money to things like Seymour Pink, American Cancer so Society, and contributions um, and thoughts and prayers to families who struggle with loss and hardship. Economic vitality. Um, we're the biggest employer in town, and the schools provide work for about 220 Seymour residents. And those employees who come to work every day are patronizing our local restaurants, supermarkets, et cetera. 34 Seymour-based businesses have performed maintenance, repairs, or other services in our school buildings so far this year, totaling $143,000. So that's taxpayer money that's going right back into the hands of business owners who live, who work and have businesses in Seymour. And when it comes to the ways that Seymour families who have students in the system can save money, well, those AP courses that I mentioned, um, they are money-saving opportunities. If you get a four or maybe a three, depending on what college you go to, uh, your parents can save money on the amount of credits you have to take in college. And the same goes for the UConn Early College Experience Program that we have. We've actually had 319 instances of students earning eligibility for a UConn credit. And the reason I phrase it that way is because not all of the students actually want to get the credit for it, you know, maybe they want to use it as a as a leg up, as a head start on college, but yet not um, get credit for it. So it's just great opportunities that the school provides to parents ways to save money. So hopefully, I've done my job and debunked those three myths for you. And now I'd like to just spend a couple of slides on some of the budget details. And the train is going by in downtown Derby. So hopefully it's not. It's going. Yeah. <laughs> it's going. Yeah, sorry, I'll get in okay. trouble for that. Okay. Well, <laughs> so our budget reflects the dynamics of a service organization. And what I mean by that is that the primary expenses revolve around the people we employ. Right? We don't have a high cost of goods, stol goods sold. We're not uh, buying metal. We're not buying chemicals. We buy people because people is what we need to supply services to the students. So you can see that the first three things, all in blue, certified staff and non-certified staff salaries, as well as employee benefits, comprise 80% of our budget. So when there are contracts in place, and those contracts have three-year cycles, we don't have a lot of flexibility to change things in any given budget year. We can't re respond to failed budgets by unilaterally making decisions to hold salaries or freeze salaries or push more of the benefits cost onto our employees. These are things that we bargain and bargain hard for in good faith during a contract cycle. So because so much of our costs are wrapped up in our employee benefits and our employee compensation, it just simply means that we're not able to be flexible and nimble on um, an annual basis. Things are very thoughtful, we plan ahead, but largely speaking, these costs are what they are. These are the same list of items that I showed you in the pie chart. And the benefit of this slide here is that you're able to see what has increased and what has decreased and what has stayed the same this year versus last year. So I had mentioned earlier that 34 of 73 line items stayed the same or went down. So the 73 line items bucket up into these 18 or 19. It's just simply too many to go through 73 all at once. So if you look at these items, um, the drivers, the increases are the certified staff, employee benefits, and tuition. We'll come back to tuition in a minute, but largely the tuition is driven by um, fees that we pay for schools where we send special needs students to get the services that we can't provide in Seymour. That makes up about, what is it, Rick, about 80% of that tuition line item is for special um, education students. The remainder of it goes to uh, magnet schools, um, special needs for kids who attend those magnet schools. So anything that we have to pay out of our pocket for someone else to provide for our students in a school setting that's outside of Seymour. It's not private schools or Catholic schools. Um, it's magnet schools and schools that provide special services to kids. 
And so you can see if you total all these up, 3.2% was the increase that we asked for, but right now, the budget that we'll be voting on, assuming nothing happens at the annual town meeting, would be for a 2.99% increase. I want to walk you through, um, I mentioned a couple of times that we need to increase the amount of services we, spent, we um, provide to special education students, and that population is increasing. I'd like to talk to you a little bit more specifically about those costs. So, um, in addition to tuition needs, when we have more children identified with special needs in our district, we have to increase the services we provide. So this first section is on in-house staff needs. We have to increase the Bungie Elementary School special education staff um, by half a position from a part-time to a full-time position. We have to do the same thing at the high school, and we have to add an instructional paraprofessional to each elementary school. Our power professionals are really critical to helping teachers in the classroom and to making sure that special needs students um, always have what they need and get the assistance that they need per their, their um, individual learning plans. And we need to increase the part-time social worker at the high school to a half-time position. Right now, it's even less than a half-time position. $130,000, um, just about, is the increase that we need to spend this year um, holding everything constant. This is already, we know we have 19 students who are outplaced. Um, we don't know if we get more. Maybe one or two will decide they can stay in school or maybe they might move to a different town. But on the flip side, we might have students who move into town over the summer that also need special services. And our budget is built to be able to accommodate that. Um, so the special education services outplace student tuition and transportation combined is $130,000 over what we have in the current year budget. And then other adjustments um, is simply a reallocation of a grade five teacher so that we can increase some of those SRBI math tutors that I had spoke about earlier so that we can have a full-time math SRBI teacher in each of our elementary schools. And we also um, know that there's a need and a desire for a couple of new clubs at the high school, the Link Crew Advisor, which actually is a club that helps ninth graders make the transition to the high school and we want to add a stipend for our Performing Arts Club Advisor. So out of all the things in our budget, truly the $5,000 that you see at the bottom of slide 35 are the only quote unquote new initiatives. And I put those in air quotes because these are things that are actually already happening. Um, we have some seed money and sometimes teachers will donate their time to see if they can get a club off the ground. And now we've got kids in these clubs already. So even that $5,000 isn't an expansion of programs, it's simply funding a program that students are already counting on. So if we take a quick look at our budget history and the number of referendums, um, you can see that you know, we're up and down a little bit in terms of the amount of money that we ask for each year. For me, that's another proof point that the Board of Ed doesn't just come in high every year. We don't make up a number that sounds good or feels good. These numbers are always backed by evidence and they always represent um, the bottom line of what we need plus documentation to support any new initiatives. The reason you see some fluctuation is driven sometimes by contractual costs, but also sometimes by other things. Like in 2013-14, that's the year that we were able to realize savings from changing the healthcare plan. So we only needed $715,000 that year, and that's all we asked for. And you can see how those lines um, look going back to 2010 and 11. The next column I'm popping up on the screen is what we finally ended up with after the numerous referendums um, were executed in the town of Seymour. So you can see that we, we largely never get what we ask for. Um, people have said to me, yeah, but you guys always make it work. So that doesn't that mean that you didn't really need that to begin with? And I will tell you unequivocally, the answer is no. Of course we make it work. We have to make it work. We're the school systems. We have to open the doors come August 26th or August 28th or September 1st. But that doesn't really mean that the schools are operating in a way that our administrators and our teachers know is optimal. So yes, we make it work. But sometimes we don't make it work in the way that it really should be working. So our budget requests is our best judgment as to what the school system really should have. And then you can see in the yellow, that's what we're ultimately given through the referendum process. So every time we don't receive what we need, and sometimes those needs do include new initiatives, but they're always backed by evidence, and we try to explain to people why we want our new initiatives, it means we have to find things to cut. 
So you can see in the red the amount of numbers, and it, going back to the earlier part of this decade when the economy was still really in the pits and we were trying to climb out of the recession in 2011 through 13, we were taking some significant hits. No business can run taking those kind of hits year over year over year. So I feel quite fortunate for the 2013-14 year. The 2014-15 was a little bit tougher. So we are really hoping that with the help of people who are listening to the call, we're really hoping that with the help of the 789 people who voted last yes last year on the second referendum, that all of us will get out and get this thing passed the first time around so that we can enter the school year knowing what we have and figuring out how to make up for the $67,000 loss, which will not be um, a significant hardship because as you can see, we have quote unquote made it work with much, much larger cuts. I wanted to overlay how many votes it took for each of these budgets to get passed at the numbers you see in the yellow or the, you know, the increase that you see in the yellow. And I wanna call your attention starting in 2012 because I think we started a pretty good trend that year. We went from four votes to three votes to last year, two votes. So if we continue the trend line, that's screaming for a one vote, one and done year this April or May. So I wanna wrap up by just restating some of the points I made um, throughout the course of this evening. So first, on a per pupil basis, Seymour spends less on education compared to the state median, to districts of our size, and within our DRG. When reductions in the school budget can be made in different light items, they are made, and we've made about $300,000 of them this year alone. The third myth, our schools are a great investment. They are. It's not, it's not true that they're not a good investment. Well, why do I say that? Well, because schools, meaning our staff and our students, contribute to economic and community vitality, and our students are experiencing and achieving in areas that will prepare them for college and careers. And last, the vast majority of our budget increases are driven by rising costs associated with providing services to students. I want to wrap up by saying, um, quoting Superintendent Syriac when she introduced her budget request that was fully and unanimously adopted by the Board of Education on January 8th, she told us that this final budget recommendation reflects my best judgment as to what the district needs at a minimum, and for me that's the key phrase, at a minimum, to meet the needs of our students while enabling the district to operate reasonably and safely and continue to make progress in addressing areas for student growth and enhancement. So we have a goal for this year. Our goal is that two people from every voting household come out to vote. Um, I've looked at the voter list, and of course you never know how anybody votes, that's completely private, but we know who does come out and vote and who doesn't come out and vote. And we can see that very oftentimes it's just the, the mom or it's just the husband, or maybe we can see that there's um, you know, a dad who came out and vote and his parents live with him, but maybe they didn't come out and vote. If we got two people from every voting household to come out and vote, this budget would pass the first time around. So that's our goal for this year, and I, I hope it, it rings true for all of you, and I hope maybe some people are sitting out there going, oh yeah, well, I went last year, but he didn't, or I went and she didn't. So everybody should go vote this year, and we would pass this. Because every vote really does count. Um, only about 13% of eligible voters voted in last year's first referendum. At this referendum, the Board of Ed budget failed by 89 votes. On the second referendum, 17% of eligible voters came out and the budget passed by only 34 votes. And we did have an occasion in the past decade where the budget passed literally by one vote. And it was an absentee ballot that had to be counted twice before they realized, oh no, wait, it really did pass. So if anyone out there thinks, well, you know, my vote doesn't count, they don't really need me to go out and vote, Yes, we do. So when I see something like only failing by 89 votes the first time around, well, if 90 people had come out, if 90 additional people had come out to vote, we, we would have won. And also I'd like to close by saying that if you're not a registered voter, you can still vote in town referendums. All you need to do is have own taxable property worth at least $1,000. And at the polling place, which is always at the community center, there's a desk that you can go to and say, well, listen, I'm not a registered voter, but look me up and I'm on the tax rolls and you would be allowed to vote. So a yes vote is a yes for Seymour's kids, for Seymour's teachers, for our property values. It's the number one thing young families wanna know when they're shopping for a home is how are the schools? And also a yes vote is a vote for our community as a whole. 
And on the comments or questions page, I just wanted to leave up the four um, wrap up points so that people could have them visually in front of them if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask. Okay. Any questions, Eugene? Yeah, there is a, and there's about a 40 second delay, so we'll see if a couple of more filter in. But the questions, and I just want to run through, we've got a chat room going, we've got Twitter uh, and Facebook. I'm just checking to see if we have any additional questions. I'm not seeing any. Okay, so we have a bunch of questions from Emma Huller, and they're coming through uh, Facebook. And I want to apologize for the phone ring. The one thing we forgot to do is to turn off the phone. <laughs> Apologies for that. But Emma Huller asks, why were there no savings when Oxford pulled out? And then that's the first yeah. part of her question. Okay. The second part of her question is what we hear all the time, not just with Seymour, but yep. school districts all the time. Why do we need so many superintendents and vice principals at over $100,000 each? Okay, well, I can speak. I'm going to take the second question first, and then I'll go to the first question, okay? Um, so the second question, every administrator in our district has a very specific role that they fill. So we don't have 10 or 11 people all trying to do the same job. We're really very thoughtful in who handles what. So at central office, for example, our CEO is Superintendent Syriac. She is our one and only superintendent. We have one. She is, um, as any CEO would be, in charge of our whole district. The buck stops with Mrs. Syriac. To assist her, just like any good CEO, she has to surround herself with smart people who know nuances and details beyond what she could possibly manage on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think of central office as the C-suite, if you will. And in a $34 million operation, I guarantee you, you would never find a company that had less than three chief or C-suite level people running that organization. So Mr. Belden, as the assistant superintendent of finance or operations, he's our CFO. He's our money guy. He's not only our money guy, he handles all the facilities. So everybody who deals with facilities bucket up and report up to Mr. Belden. But he's the guy that we go to for operations, like hardcore operations, making sure that the um, schools are ready to be opened physically, making sure that we have the equipment that we need to clean the floors and all those kinds of things, in addition to managing all of the accounting and reporting for the accounts um, receivable and accounts payable. On the other side of the C-suite, if you will, we have the associate superintendent of curriculum and instruction. Mm -hmm. That person is largely tasked with making sure that all of our students are learning what they need to know. And there's also a heavy reporting component to that in terms of looking at what assessments we should have in district, reporting to the state on how well we're doing in achieving our goals. So they have very, very different roles. I'll switch gears and talk a little bit at the building level division of responsibility as well. In Seymour, we have had occasion where we have only had a principal, one principal in our elementary schools, and that principal was supported by an administrative intern. Well, what's happened in the state of Seymour, as well as largely all over the nation, is there's been a uh, renewed focus on teacher evaluation systems in the past three to five years. And much of the way we operate our teacher evaluation system is dictated by the state. So for example, the state tells us how many times we have to observe a teacher. The state tells us that after you give a teacher an evaluation, you only have a certain amount of time before you're having a sit down conversation with that teacher. And all of those things have a lot of merit. I mean, no one wants to get evaluated and wait two months to have a conversation with their boss. But when you have 40 certified staff in a school, there's no possible way that one person could evaluate in a thoughtful manner that helps that employee figure out what they need to um, become a better teacher. There's no way one person could do that for 40 people in terms of getting into the classroom, looking and seeing what the teacher's doing, reviewing lesson plans and things of that nature. So it's just not practical to have only one principal trying to do the evaluations of all the certified staff in a school. And following the state program, we have to and follow, follow the state program, exactly. It's not just one time. Yep. And at the high school, um, I have definitely heard people say, well, we're a small high school. Why do we need two assistant principals? Um, in response to that statement, that's absolutely one of the reasons that we are eliminating the, assist, the um, athletic director position, and we're putting that responsibility on one of our assistant principals. At the high school level, I love the way we have um, sort of focused. They've done it on their own, quite frankly. I can't take credit for it. But at the high school, we've got Paul Lucky, 
who is um, like a bull in a china cabinet when it comes to finding innovative grants and innovative programs to bring to our high school. Um, he is the one to thank for the Electrothon cars and the grant that made that possible. So I feel really comfortable that all of our administrators play very unique roles. And I don't tend to let myself get caught up in, well, they're a small district and they only have two principals or one principal and one assistant principal at the high school because all of um, the people in our district are making a unique contribution. <coughs> Oxford, so the first part of your question, well, we did realize savings when the Oxford students exited, but it wasn't a great big savings all in one year because it was a slow exit. So a couple of things to keep in mind when we think about the Oxford exit, um, they only comprised about one third of the high school and the high school only comprises about one third of the entire district. So it's not like one year we had 2,600 kids and the next year we had 2,100 kids. Um, it was a slow and thoughtful one, one grade at a time, kids phasing out. And that's actually how um, part of the reason we were able to quote unquote make it work back in 2009 and 2010 when we didn't get any budget increase alone. Well, we did reduce our staff. Our staff we do have fewer teachers by, now. I think 19 was the total number. Yeah, so we uh, lost over, 19 over teachers. Years, over four years, we lost 19 teachers. But I'm saying as those Oxford students left, they took revenue with them. That's right. Because Oxford was paying us for those children. So as they left, we lost that revenue. So we had to still run the school with less revenue. Right. And at the same time, they were leaving, all the regular costs were going up. Yes. Things like health insurance and electricity and all the that. Size of the building didn't change. Yeah. You know, the, the model electricity use didn't change. All that stuff still continued to go up as we lost revenue and lost students. Yeah. But we did reduce by 19 teachers over four years. Yep. And there was and there were some other reductions as well. Okay. And then uh, Emma asked, and this was actually the question I was going to ask as well. Mm -hmm. One thing we always hear in school districts is that, uh, you know, the giant portion of the budget is contract contractual obligations. Mm -hmm. There's nothing we can really do about it. And you, you actually addressed this a little bit in the, in the presentation. But... Uh, is there any way, there's a lot of talk about bringing the public into the uh, the process. Mm -hmm. What about uh, getting more people on board, or is there any way to get people on board when you're, when you're doing those contractual obligations, when you're actually doing negotiations, or, or to at least tell people that it's happening? No, you, no, you, you can't. really can't. can't. In, those, in those, fact, we, before you, Yashu's speak, because Yashu's on the liaison committee, right. in fact, um, most of us on the Board of Education are not privy to being a part of those negotiations, and that's by that's, design. So, I guess my, my or my question is, what about that? It's even happening. So I think I think residents, or at least myself as a resident mm -hmm. in the city where I live, there's a frustration because here's the budget, our taxes might go up, but there's this. Well, ninety percent of it's just out of our hands, but it was in your it's, hands at one point. Well, it's, it's in our hands at one point. That's correct, mm -hmm. and that's what, what you're saying. It's out of our hands because. So if our budget failed, we can't go back to the union and say, "Hey, we don't have as much money this year." Can you take a cut in your pay? We can't do that because that's already been negotiated over the over a three year period. So, if they get a two point nine percent increase this year, but we only get a two point five percent increase in our budget, we can't say, "Hey, can you take four percent back?" It's contracted that way. We have to give them what's mm -hmm. we contracted, and it goes in a three year cycle with all of our contracts. And we do I don't know four or five every year, so there's there's overlap. <clears throat> so. In those contract negotiations, we work really hard as best we can to keep the increases down as best as possible. But but I will I will respond to um, the the point you made, Eugene, and, and if Emma was making it as well, it, we could do a better job at letting people know I which have heard union exact which question. yeah. Was why isn't the public notified when there are union negotiations? Okay, well, all right. So, wait, wait, so wait, wait. you you can't. We really can't notify yeah, you right. when union negotiations are because they're not open to the public. So, it really, wouldn't do you any good. But what we could notify the public of is what unions are coming up for negotiation in the mm -hmm. coming months. So everybody can look and see what cycles the contracts are on and when, for example, the teachers union will teachers union contract will expire. And absolutely, the Board of Education could let the public know that this summer, for example, we'll be starting to work on the contracts that will expire next summer. Because sometimes these take an entire year, if not longer, mm -hmm. to negotiate. So um, there's no doubt, there's no question, and, and I'll make sure that we do put that information out there so people do know the timing of our contracts for our different units. They can be notified, but if, as a member of the public, I can't walk in. No, you cannot no, walk in. As a matter of fact, yeah, there's, there's three people on that committee that do the negotiations from the Board of Ed. The other six members are not allowed in. Right. 
It's the only committee we have that yeah. operates that way. Correct. And and there's very good reasons for it. I mean, it is a process. It's a negotiation. It's a negotiation. There's information that you can't let out to the public. You can't let the union side know what the the administrative side is thinking and vice versa. Those are kind of stuff. You, it would ruin your negotiations if that was the case. Okay. And then just uh, Emma's a one-woman show, <laughs> which I appreciate. Well, why can't uh, they, I guess she must mean school uh, employees, pay for their own health insurance like everyone else does? Yeah. Why the increase in retirement benefits? Oh, okay. Uh, let me clarify. It's not an increase in retirement benefits. It's um, retirement benefits that it's paid out are employees. paid out to people who right. are retiring and those again were things that were negotiated in prior contracts right. um, so it's not an increase in retirement benefits it's because some people are retiring we owe them money according more, to their their contracts yeah. um, what was the first part of the question uh, why can't they pay for their own health insurance and, like and they everyone do. else we'll, we'll yeah. we'll they, they, they do pay a portion and we've made great strides over the past several contract cycles in, in pushing a greater proportion to the employee. But many people do have jobs where the employer picks up a percentage and the employee picks up a percentage. Mm -hmm. And so we're always looking at that during contract negotiations. Yes. Yes. And Rick has something to, um, to contribute to that as yeah, well. Just a couple of things. In, in contract negotiations, um, as Yashu and Kristen both pointed out, it's a three-year cycle. And just by the very nature of negotiations, Neither side gets everything they want during each cycle. So uh, we've been fortunate in Seymour that we take a long view on how we're approaching contract negotiations, and we have specific goals that we want to try and accomplish. Obviously, the monetary portion, how much the salaries are, those are to a large degree dictated by what's happening in the state with other contracts as they're being negotiated. Because that's what happens when you go to arbitration. If you can't reach a deal at the table and you get to arbitration, which we're mandated to do in the state of Connecticut for a certified staff, they're going to look to what other contracts are settling that. So what we've been doing for the past four cycles now is looking at what can we do to mitigate or eliminate long-term costs that are going to benefit the town. For example, we talked about retiree benefits. No teacher hired after 2007 can get the benefits we're just talking about there, which is the payout of some of their sick days. So those teachers from 2007 on don't get that payment anymore. So it's going to take some time for some future board and the taxpayers to see the benefit of that contract change. We do the same thing in health insurance. We change to uh, high deductible plans, which are much more common in the private sector. Seymour Board of Ed's always had employees paying a portion of that. We've always had a copay, and we are starting to see them rise to the level you see in the private sector. The current contract for 2015-16, teachers are paying between 13 and 18 percent of the health insurance cost to the Board of Education as uh, coming out of their paychecks. The administrators are at 17 and 20 percent. So those are the kind of numbers you hear about in the private sector, and we have moved to that over the past two contract cycles. Because the arbitrators recognize also that, you know, recognizing the economic situation we're in, so the contracts are settling more in that level. So we're getting those kind of awards if it does go to arbitration, and both sides know that's where they may end up. So negotiations get a little bit easier in that sense, because they know that this is where our marketplace is right now. And those percentages are specific in the contracts that we sign, a three-year deal, and those that's in there. And what we tend to do is, Trying to move them up every year. It's it was ten percent this year, thirteen percent the next year, seventeen percent in the third year, which is where we are in the, in the present contract. And that stuff is public information. If you want to know where it is, you can you can see you can look at those contracts. It's public information. Okay, uh, Richard Margansky is asking through Facebook. Would it be great to see increases for STEM education. Yeah. Is there interest in robotics competitions? Mm -hmm. First robotics competition. He says in parentheses. Mm -hmm. Personally, he would like to see. More money spent there rather than fine arts. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Even though where he's at. <laughs> well, we're going to get a question now from the of fine arts. Where's the man? But okay. So in the middle school, we do have a STEM program that started this year in the middle school. It had been on our radar screen. It had been on our top priority list for the past couple of years, and this year we were able to make it happen. So I'm very excited that we've got a formal STEM curriculum in the middle school. The kids take it as part of one of their specials in the same way they take art and music, some of the fine arts. In the high school, um, quite a lot of what they do is technically STEM or at least STEM related. So some of the CAD courses, the computer assisted design, uh, where they're using 3D printers, uh, the engineering courses that we offer. So we are making really good progress in the area of STEM and I agree with you completely that it is where the jobs are and it's where we need to make sure our kids are getting opportunities. And if I could just follow up on that, um, 
just to give you a sense, in the budget that we're putting forward for 2015-16, that's year two of the rollout of a three-year plan for the STEM program at the middle school. Because uh, to give you a sense of the cost, we bought a curriculum um, that costs approximately $70,000 a year to implement. So we've already eaten the first $70,000. Year two, we're eating another 70, and then year three, it's things a little bit less than that. And the other piece is it's articulated or it feeds into the high school program. Both the high school and the middle school worked collaboratively to make sure that what we got at the middle school was going to have a form of baseline for the high school courses. So we are doing a lot in STEM. And on the fine arts side, we actually hired uh, last year, was it last year, a second art teacher, fine arts teacher at high school with an emphasis in the graphic arts. Mm -hmm. uh, huge amount of uh, job opportunities in graphic arts and types of things like that. The person we hired has a great background in that and we've seen a lot of benefit from it for the kids in the current school year. And I absolutely know, just to, to wrap up that, that question, unless of course you have a follow-up, that our high school administrators do have their eye on a robotics program. They do tend to be expensive, so truly, um, we live in a, in a great area where we've got terrific technology and industries around us. So if you work in one of those industries or you know of grants that are available, absolutely bring them to the attention of the board or directly to the high school administration because they're always looking for ways to find to fund those kinds of programs. But those electric cars also help because those kids are designing and building yeah. those electric cars. It's part of robotics as well. Okay, so we're closing. It's been about 50 minutes. Uh, I'm not seeing any more questions from the, let me just run through this to make sure I'm not missing anything through email, or Twitter, <laughs> Facebook, uh, I guess the only question that I had, I saw there was an increase for, uh, I believe it was uh, tuition. Yeah. Uh, okay. Not for, for uh, not special ed tuition, but regular mm -hmm. yes. tuition, which uh, was surprising to me. And I'm just wondering, I mean, these are kids going to you want magnet to? schools. Correct. And Absolutely why are correct. kids, right. what's that number in terms of real kids and why do they need to see one? Well, um, because there's, a lot of choice in Connecticut right now for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, the Shep O'Neill decision at, at Hartford has opened up a number of magnet schools. Charter schools are very popular nowadays, the funding that's going into those. Um, we have students that attend Nanawag, which is a vocational agricultural program. Sound School in New Haven, the maritime type of applications. Education Center for the Arts in New Haven. Students have a very specific interest in music, uh, the visual arts, you know, dance. Those are specialty type of programs. So what happens is the way it's structured in Connecticut right now, we have to contribute dollars to those programs in the form of tuition. We have uh, eight students at Education Center for the Arts for next year. We have 10 students at Sound School. We're going to have 24 students at Nanawag High School. And then in addition, what happens is if our students attend a magnet school, you don't necessarily have to pay tuition to all the magnet schools. But those in particular, we do like Evan O'Brien is not considered a magnet school. That's a vocational that's technical. A we just provide transportation. That's in our budget, the transportation mm -hmm. to get the kids there. Platt Tech, that's another one that we send kids to. But what happens is if there's a special needs student in either any of those places or also in a magnet school that we don't pay tuition to, we still own that child for special needs purposes. And we may have to send money to that school to cover the special needs program for that child. So that's what's... There's a special needs program for outplaced kids that we can't satisfy ourselves. But then there's other group of kids that are attending regular schools that have a specific niche. And then there's a third bucket of special needs kids, have an IEP, attending a magnet school. And we're still responsible for them. That's all wrapped up into that dollars. And then the transportation to get our students to these places, mm -hmm. we pay for that also. And that's something okay. that's completely out of our control. If you live in Seymour, Eugene, and you want to send your kid to Nanawa, and your kid gets accepted there, yep. Not much sense a bill. That's it. We have no choice. Okay. Uh, I think that it'll, well, well, I have one notification. Let's just check this real fast. And as I, s okay, here we have another comment slash question. Uh, this is from uh, Diane Val Valdez or Valdez. Mm -hmm. It would be great to increase the, s it would be great to increase the per pupil spending to get closer to the median. I guess of the state, mm -hmm. and the staff and students should be proud of the academic achievements you listed, plus many more. Can you share how we're doing academically against these median towns mm -hmm. you are comparing us to? 
Yeah, um, I actually can't, and there's a reason I can't, because we don't um, take the CMTs anymore. So prior to uh, last year, when all the districts took the CMTs, that was the easiest number you could go to. That's only one number, though. So we don't have a really good system in place in Connecticut, certainly not now, and we didn't even when we just solely relied on CMT scores, um, in terms of getting everybody on the same page in term, using the same metrics. So we can do things like compare graduation rates, which we are right at or a little bit above the state average for graduation rates. We um, can compare things like number of kids who take AP courses, and we are slightly above the state average on number of kids taking AP courses. But when we talk about the elementary school and the middle school, it's much, much harder to put our academic achievement into context with other surrounding schools or, or the state of Connecticut, simply because we don't have the in-kind measures in place. That's one of the things the state wants to work towards, not without a whole lot of controversy, um, because there are some people who don't want us to be taking state assessments any longer, um, but that was the one measure that at least all schools had in common but there are people who rightly feel like well if it's not a good measure then better to not have any measure at all so it's a great question um, it's a little bit easier to do with high school achievement than it is to do with elementary and middle school achievement simply because people don't use the same measures across the districts okay uh, someone just emailed in uh, this person feels like the kids need more AP classes at the high school uh, I don't know. It's not really a formal question. But uh -huh. just, just yep. A comment. Yep. Well, we're doing, we're doing well. We've, we've increased our AP courses quite a bit. We're up to 13 now, which is yeah. very good. And the other thing that we do at the high school is because we're so small, we put a lot of AP courses on rotation. Um, but it's specifically designed so that a student in 10th, 11th, or 12th grade will have the opportunity to take whatever given AP course it is. And that's really hard to do because some of them have prerequisites. But for example, we can't offer. Um, Rich, do you have an example of one of the APs that we don't offer every single year? So we rotate it in and out right. simply because we only have, you know, a little under 200 students in every grade in the high school. So we, we do try to bring in AP courses and we try to get creative in terms of rotating them in and out to give um, many students the opportunity to take them. The one thing we do do, however, and to address that, you may have students in a situation where they missed the window, so to speak, for a particular AP course. We do participate in the virtual high school program, so a student can take an online course. We partner with uh, ACES to do that, and they can take that course online. So if they have a very big interest in some type of biology that's not in the sequence, they can still get access to that course online, and we pay for that access. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we're, we're, we're at an hour. I think that's probably uh, uh, the time we have. Very good. I'm not seeing any other uh, questions oh. on here. Uh, and I just want to thank everyone for coming down here. I mean, this is great. Uh, just this is what we want to do. And uh, maybe next year we'll come to you. Okay. <laughs> if we're still around. Good. Okay. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ethan and Eugene. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.